Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Lipica Goyle, Juan Valle, who's here, Flavio Roca, and Emma Fatakov to come join me here. Um, the next section is, are going to be updates in therapy. And so if all the speakers could come up to the front uh, and join me at the table if they're here. And um, just so the speakers know, everyone will have 15 minutes. The lights will indicate uh, the yellow light when there's a, about a minute left and red when we're, when we're there. And, uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, so uh, welcome. And uh, our first speaker will be uh, Lipica. Lisa, thank you for that really incredibly moving story. I think your story highlights the importance of why we're all here and doing this. Thank you. You're really an inspiration for all of us. So thank you to the Clangio Carcinoma Foundation for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to speak to you about immunotherapy. It's the dawn of the immunotherapy era. And is this the beginning of the end of cancer? If there's one therapy that has a chance of doing this, I think immunotherapy is one of the hottest things on the block right now and has a chance of doing this. Or do I have a clicker? My disclosures. So I'm first going to talk, this is the first talk of the conference, so I'll talk a little bit about cholangiocarcinoma and how we treat it and a little bit about the history of immunotherapy. Then I'll talk about how does the body kill cancer and how we can harness the power of the immune system to kill cholangiocarcinoma. And then there are at least two examples of immunotherapies that are already working in cholangiocarcinoma, and I'll highlight those two. And then I'll talk about what clinical trials we have available for where do we go from here. So cholangiocarcinoma is a cancer of the bile ducts. Bile is a substance that's made by the liver that travels down these green pipes that you see down into your small intestine and helps you digest your fat. And sometimes in these green tubes that are called bile ducts, People develop cancer when it's inside the liver, it's intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. When it's outside the liver, it's extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And the gallbladder is also part of the biliary tract, and these three together are often lumped together and called biliary tract cancer. Some people have postulated that cholangiocarcinoma is actually really ripe for immunotherapy because one of the risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer is chronic inflammation. Having chronic stones in your bile ducts or your gallbladder can lead to cancer. Parasites have been known to be a risk factor for cholangiocarcinoma. Having hepatitis C or hepatitis B or alcohol, which can, uh, having a history of strong alcohol use, all of those things can cause inflammation in the liver. And then also fatty liver disease related to diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, that can also lead to inflammation in the liver. And because the immune system is revved up, people have talked about cholangiocarcinoma being a good target for immunotherapy. So when cholangiocarcinoma is diagnosed in the early stages, we send patients to surgery, and we always hope that we can do that. Unfortunately, cholangiocarcinoma is often diagnosed in the late stages about 75% of the time, and in those cases, we think about systemic therapy. What is systemic therapy? It's treatment that goes throughout your whole system. And I think of systemic therapy in three different buckets or three different kinds, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immune therapy. Chemotherapy is what we all know about. It's what we think about when we think about killing cancer. Gemcitabine and cisplatin is the standard. And uh, we have other chemotherapies that we also use, and that's what we often use in the first line. But then we always think ahead for plan B. For all of our patients, all your doctors, while you're going through plan A, people are thinking about plan B also. What is targeted therapy? This is the idea of personalized medicine. And so we sequence people's tumors, we figure out are there any mutations that we can target, and then we give certain pills or certain IV drugs that try to turn off the pathways that are turned on by one specific mutation. And now the new kid on the block is immunotherapy. And this is what I'm going to focus my presentation on today. So a fundamental truth, every cancer has been diagnosed, that has been diagnosed has figured out a way to defend itself against the immune system. The immune system attacks foreigners, but somehow cancer cells have found a way to escape the immune system. The general principle of immunotherapy is any individual's cancer 
can be eradicated if the immune system can be educated or enabled to do so. So let's go back to the history of immunotherapy. This guy, Dr. Coley, is uh, known as the father of immunotherapy. He was around in the 1800s at a hospital called Memorial Hospital in New York. And he was moved by a 17-year-old patient who had a cancer in her hand, a bone cancer. And she actually had an amputation of her forearm, but her cancer spread quickly and she died within a couple of weeks. This was very understandably distressing to Dr. Coley and he did some research and he, remember, he remembers hearing about a case of a patient who had an inoperable neck cancer. And that patient got something called erysepelas, which is a strep infection of the skin. And the patient's tumor disappeared. And so then he looked in the literature and he found several more cases of patients who had some sort of infection and their tumor disappeared. So what he did was in 1891, he injected a patient with a tumor with streptococcus, this bacteria. And that patient had shrinkage of his tumor. And over the next 40 years of his career, as a bone and soft tissue surgeon, he injected more than 1,000 patients with what is called Coley's toxin. In the end, it didn't work, and that's why we don't hear about it today. But basically, what it does is, the idea behind it is, if you can rev up the immune system, you may be able to rev up the immune system against cancer. And that was the whole point of injecting uh, this bacteria. So let's talk about how the body kills cancer. There are basically three steps. The first step is tumor recognition. So there are these cells called, called antigen-presenting cells, APCs, and they basically are the messengers in the immune system. And the APCs go around and they find cancer and the cancer cells present some sort of protein on the surface. I'm gonna call it green slime to make it something that's easy to relate to. And what these messengers do is they pick up a little bit of that green slime and they present it to the soldiers, the T cells of our immune system. And they say, T cell, whenever you see this green slime attack, and the T cells are among the most important cells in our immune system when it comes to cancer, and they are constantly scouring our body to look for foreign invaders and infection. And so now they know, okay, green slime, go and attack. Step two is immune cell activation. And that's basically the T cells drinking a lot of caffeine and getting all souped up and ready to go into action. But with every system, there are checks and balances. And so we have a protein called CTLA-4 on our T cells that helps keep the T cells in check because they're like eager children who want to get into the soccer game and say, coach, put me in. But these this protein basically stands as a block and a check on the system, which is good. We want to check on our immune system, but in the case of cancer, we don't want that check. And so we have drugs that can block CTLA-4, and I'm going to talk about those. The last step is tumor infiltration. So now you have these souped-up T cells that are ready to attack, but what they have to do is they have to get inside the tumor. And what the tumors do is they can sometimes display this protein called PDL1 and it's basically like building a wall. They build a wall and the tumor cells can't get in. And that's not, I mean, the T cells can't get in. And that's not good because you need your T cells in your tumor in order to be able to kill it. So we have a couple of drugs that now block PDL1. Lisa is on one of them, actually. And I'm going to talk about the success they're having in cholangiocarcinoma. So I'm going to use this framework and talk about on each of these different steps of the killing of cancer cells how we have drugs to attack. So the first one, step one, enhancing tumor recognition, we have vaccines, TCR therapy, CAR T-cell therapy, and adoptive T-cell therapy. Vaccines, you may have heard of something called Provenge. It was approved in prostate cancer. How do cancer vaccines work? They basically take blood from the patient, isolate immune cells, and then educate those immune cells to recognize certain proteins that are on the cancer. And then they raise those immune cells, make a lot of them, and inject billions of cells back into someone's body. But this approach is dependent on at least two things. One, you need a protein that's common to a lot of people's different cholangiocarcinomas. So on prostate cancer, there's a protein called prostate acid phosphatase PAP, and PAP is present on 95% of prostate cancers. So finding that magic protein that we can attack with a vaccine, that's a tough thing. And then two, you have to find a protein that's unique to the cancer and not on other cells in the body. So if you find a protein that's on the cholangiocarcinoma, but also in your liver, on the healthy tissue, 
when you inject those educated immune cells back into someone's body, they can attack both the liver and the cholangiocarcinoma, and you don't want that. So vaccines are a tricky business, but we're certainly working on them, and I don't know of any vaccines that are out there for cholangiocarcinoma right now, but there's certainly efforts in, this, in cancer in general for vaccines. TCR therapy and CAR T cell therapy, they're basically ways to engineer your T cells to be able to recognize specific antigens on cancer to be able to kill them. As far as I know, there are no TCR CAR T cell therapies specifically directed at cholangiocarcinoma right now, but this is also coming down the pipeline. I do want to focus on adoptive T cell therapy because Melinda Bikini, who introduced herself earlier and spoke at this conference a couple of years ago, she was a recipient of adoptive T cell therapy, and so we know this has worked in at least one patient with cholangiocarcinoma. So Melinda was in the New York Times a couple of years ago. Uh, she is a paramedic from Billings, Montana, and she's a mom of six children. And um, this is a paper that was written about the uh, effect of adoptive T cell therapy against her cancer in science. And the doctor who's pioneering this therapy is a man named Steve Rosenberg, who is another one of the doctors who's known as the father of immunotherapy. He is an investigator at the NIH, and uh, the story of Melinda is that she is a woman in her 40s who was diagnosed around 2009 with metastatic cholangiocarcinoma in her liver and her lungs. The liver, the lung metastases, some of them were resected and they were sequenced, and they found 26 different genetic abnormalities. These mutations were presented in RNA, in, in RNA form, to tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and the T cells rec uh, recognized a specific mutation on Melinda cells, ERBB2IP. These T cells that were reactive to this specific mutation were cloned and expanded, so there were billions of cells, and then they were injected back into her body with IL2, which is something to basically enhance the immune system. And she had 30% shrinkage of her tumors by about seven months. The treatment worked for about a year, and then she had some uh, spots in her lungs that started to grow, and then she got another infusion. So this is a therapy that is very successful in patients with liquid tumors like leukemia, lymphoma, and it's starting to also be successful in some solid tumors. Melinda, we're really happy about, has had success in cholangiocarcinoma, and so all of my patients, I at least, if they're interested, ask them to contact the NIH to see if they could be candidates for this. So step two we talked about was improving the immune, is improving immune activation. So we talked about how we want the T cells to drink caffeine and go and kill the um, cancer cells, but if they drink too much caffeine, they could also attack the rest of our bodies. And so CTLA-4 is a protein that acts as a break on the system but we can target that break and give drugs that basically turn off that break. So the one, the drug that has been approved for melanoma is a drug called ipilimumab or Yervoy. There is another CTLA-4 antibody called tremolumumab, which is currently being um, trialed in liver cancers and bile duct cancers in patients who are also getting a combination of other liver-directed therapies, such as radiation, ablation, or chemotherapy injected into their tumors. The third step is getting the immune cells into the tumor. I talked about PD-1 and PD-L1. So basically, T cells have PD-1, which is a receptor on their surface, and they use this to probe for cancer cells throughout the body. And when they see that a cancer cell is presenting PD-L1, they courteously just walk right by and they don't attack that cancer cell. And so if we have drugs that can block this interaction, we can prevent the tumors escaping recognition from the immune system. And we, in fact, do have drugs that are called pdl one inhibitors, and they're making a big splash in cancer right now. So in lung cancer, lung cancer is a disease that's hard to treat, and um, it's also very common. And so when we saw that pdl one inhibitors, um, you can see from the first uh, two scans, this is before treatment, the patient had, um, had some tumors, and then at two months, the tumor grew a little bit, but then at four months, you can see the tumor significantly disappeared. And when we saw this reaction to pdl one inhibitors in lung cancer, 
people got very excited, and this was sort of the birth of immuno-oncology um, in cancer. And since then, there have been several different trials in lung cancer with nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are both PD-L, PD-1 inhibitors that have been successful for treating lung cancer. And now, PD-1 inhibitors are being used in a lot of different cancers and have been approved for a lot of different cancers. There's been success in kidney cancer, success in lymphoma, success in melanoma, also success in head and neck cancer and bladder cancer. So what is the effect of pembrolizumab in patients with cholangiocarcinoma? There's one trial called the Keynote 028 trial. Where they looked at 89 patients who had biliary cancers. So this included intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and also gallbladder cancer. And they tested to see which patients have PDL1 positivity on their tumor or the surrounding tissue. They found that 42% of patients had PDL1, at least 1% PDL1 positivity, and those people were enrolled in this trial to get pembrolizumab. And all patients had previously been treated with chemotherapy, and now we're looking for plan B, C, or D. Four patients had at least 30% shrinkage. That's about 17% of the patients that were enrolled. Four patients had stable disease. And the dramatic finding from this study was that there were several patients who, out of these eight patients, who benefited for more than six months, some more than a year. And so we're always looking for any plan that we have to last for as long as possible. So the fact that some patients were deriving benefit for more than a year, we were very excited about that. What are the side effects of this, of this drug? Uh, Lisa talked about some of them. In this trial, 17% of patients had fever, 13% of patients had nausea. There were some serious side effects like severe anemia, autoimmune anemia where the body was attacking its own red blood cells, colitis or inflammation of the colon, and dermatitis, which is similar to the rash that Lisa was talking about. So while most patients tolerate pembrolizumab quite well, I would say up to about 10% of patients can have some severe reaction to it, usually immune-related. The second place pembrolizumab has helped patients with cholangiocarcinoma is in those that have tumors that have difficulty repairing DNA damage. So we have these proteins called mismatch repair proteins, and they're basically involved in helping us repair a specific kind of DNA damage. And some tumors are deficient in these proteins, and your doctor can order this test on your tumor. And when there's deficiency of this, we have found that these tumors accumulate a lot of mutations, and the immune system is able to recognize these tumors quite well. And so there was a trial that was led by Dr. Dung Lee at Johns Hopkins, where they looked at 41 patients. Some patients had mismatch repair deficiency. Some patients did not. And what did they find? Of the 41 patients, 32 had colon cancer, and nine patients did not have colon cancer. Of those nine patients that did not have colon cancer, four patients had cholangiocarcinoma, or another cancer called periampulary cancer, which is related to cholangiocarcinoma. Of these nine patients, seven of those patients had a scan by the time they did this study and were valuable for this, what we call a waterfall plot. How do you look at this plot? It's basically each bar constitutes one patient. Anyone, any bar that's above the line means the tumor grew. Any bar that's below the line means the tumor shrank. And so you can see the black bars are patients who did not have colon cancer. So some of those patients may have had cholangiocarcinoma. Five of the seven patients had significant tumor shrinkage if they had mismatch repair deficiency. And so that's a 70% rate of shrinkage on pembrolizumab in patients who lacked this ability to repair their DNA. 70% of patients also, uh, also were doing well at five months without any growth of their cancer if they had this mismatch repair deficiency. So you might be asking, how frequent is this uh, mismatch repair deficiency in cholangiocarcinoma? It hasn't been studied extensively, but my feeling is it's probably around 5 to 10%, and it's something that your doctor can check for. The other question that is often asked about who's going to benefit from immunotherapy is, is there a high mutational burden? So there's some companies that are now checking for this. Foundation Medicine is one of them. And they check for, what is the mutation burden? How many mutations does this cancer have? So there are certain cancers, such as melanoma, which is caused by sun damage, 
lung cancer, which is caused by smoking damage, and also head and neck cancer, which can be caused by smoking and lung uh, smoking and alcohol damage, um, bladder cancer, um, and kidney cancer. These tumors tend to have a high mutational burden. The bladder cancer, lung, and melanoma are all the way on the high end of the spectrum. Kidney cancer and head and neck are more in the middle. Cholangiocarcinoma, it's such, a, it's such a rare cancer that didn't quite make it onto this list, but it's probably somewhere around where pancreas cancer is, which is right around in the middle. And we find that tumors with high mutational burden do have um, a great response to immunotherapy. So it's another thing that your doctor can check to see, does the tumor have high mutational burden? So what do I check on my patients if I'm thinking about immunotherapy as something as an option as plan B or C? I check their PDL1 status, I check their mismatch repair status, and more recently I have been checking for tumor mutational burden. So as you can see, we've made a lot of advances in immunotherapy over the years. We started back in the 1980s and 90s with something called IL-2, and then uh, Sepulicil is the Provenge. Ipilimumab is a CTLA-4 antibody uh, that was uh, approved for melanoma. And then more recently, in the last couple of years, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, which are the PD-1 inhibitors, have really made a big splash. Now the combination of IPI and nevo, combining the PD-L1 inhibitor and the CTLA-4 inhibitor, that's been shown to be effective in melanoma and is approved, and now is being tested in several other cancers. And then there are all these novel treatments like CAR T-cell therapy, TCR therapy, more and more that we're going to see coming down the pipeline. So what do we have available for patients with cholangiocarcinoma? These are the different clinical trials that I could find on the clinicaltrials.gov website, which is a great place to look for clinical trials for yourself. Uh, there's some that are adoptive T-cell therapy that we talked about, which is the one that Melinda got. There is anti-PD-1 therapy, which is the one that Lisa got anti-CTLA-4 antibody that hasn't yet shown to be effective in cholangiocarcinoma, but there's certainly a trial for it. And then dendritic cell, this is an antigen-presenting cell. There's some DC-based vaccines. And then uh, Katie Kelly, who's one of our investigators from UCSF, led a trial on pembrolizumab with G GMCSF, and she's going to be presenting the poster uh, at this conference, so you can look out for that. So in summary, for immunotherapy, the era has arrived. Responses and improved survival are being seen in a number of diseases, and it's now increasingly being studied in cholangiocarcinoma. The therapy is generally well tolerated, although there are some side effects that we have to watch out for. And coming soon, we have pdl one inhibitors with various combinations with tons of different kinds of drugs, including chemo and targeted therapy, CAR T cells, adoptive T cell therapies, and to end on a high note, the cure rate is unknown, but cures are happening. And all of us as doctors are always hoping for a miracle for all of our patients. So keep hope. We're all rooting for you. Thank you, Lipika.